recording now. And uh, for those uh, who uh, don't know what is a tea time, a brief uh, introduction. Tea time is a network of researchers funded by EU via cost. Uh, European Cooperation in Science and Technology. We have came together to share the experience, uh, to develop new ideas and disseminate uh, the opportunities offered by exciting new technologies uh, for monitoring and recording the animal behavior in the home cage. With ultimate goal to improve the quality and validity of biomedical research and promote also free R's principle. Uh, if you wish to uh, receive uh, more news uh, in future from this action, please visit our website and subscribe for newsletter. Uh, now I have a, a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Vivek Kumar uh, from the Jackson Laboratory. Vivek received uh, uh, his PhD in 2003 from University of California, San Diego, after working with uh, Dr. Michael Rosenfeld on structural and biochemical characterization of transcriptional co repressors. And as a postdoctoral fellow, Vivek joined the lab of Joseph uh, Takahashi for several years and did research on functional genomics uh, approaches to dissect the genetics of addiction. Since 2015, Vivek has a position at the Jackson's laboratory and his group consists of geneticists, neuroscientists and computer scientists. The aim is at discovering novel targets and models through innovative methods uh, to address the problems of psychiatric disorders. Uh, for that reason, they develop better animal models and importantly also animal phenotyping methods. The group is using computer vision approaches to quantitate behavior and functional approaches to understand its underlying neuronal and genetic architecture. Today, Vivek uh, will tell us about his fascinating uh, research, which is also very relevant to our action. So please, Vivek, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Butle. It was a very generous introduction. It's great to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about our recent work uh, at the Jackson Laboratory. The work is uh, really done by a fairly transdisciplinary group of folks uh, that span uh, everything from, uh, you know, traditional neuroscience to doing things like slice physiology to uh, biostatistics and computational, uh, uh, neuros uh, computational neuroscience and also just computer science in, in general. So um, uh, this is a brief outline of the talk. We're going to talk about this better mass phenotyping approaches my lab has taken uh, in terms of technology development. And then I, I actually am not going to talk so much about the application of this in drug development, although you will see that I'll mention this in, in, in several of the slides in terms of preclinical models. Instead, I'm going to focus more on how these methods could be implemented in, your, in, uh, in labs outside uh, my lab in the Jackson Laboratory. And so for those of you who don't know, I'm at the Jackson Laboratory in, in Bar Harbor, Maine, where a nonprofit research institute that's almost a uh, hundred years old. Back here is Acadia National Park. So we're in a really beautiful area. The town population is around 5,000 in the winter and around we get 3 million visitors. Uh, last year was 4 million visitors in the area um, because of the national park. So it's, it's a beautiful area. Our um, mission at the Jackson Laboratory is to discover precise genomic solutions for disease and empower the biomedical research, a uh, biomedical community and shared quest to improve human health. Um, and, you know, my lab has been kind of focused on this question of psychiatric conditions. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, did you start sharing the slides? Oh, sure. Sorry. No, no, that's not your fault. That's me. Hold on. Okay, great. You can see this now? Yes, it works. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So my lab folks, um, 
uh, just a talk outline that I mentioned, and then to the action laboratory. Um, and this is a slide I was on. So uh, my lab is really focused on, on this need of better psychiatric treatments. Um, and there are many reasons. I mean, a, a lot of pharma companies have you know, kind of stepped out of this space. NIH is trying to pick up the slack in terms of uh, drug development a little bit. There are many reasons uh, for kind of this, you know, lack of innovation in this space. I would argue that um, better preclinical animal models are really critical in uh, uh, drug development, and, and we need to deliver that to the community. Um, and in order to kind of do that, we really need to think about, you know, how do we study behaviors in, in the mouse? Uh, and of course, if we could ask a mouse how it feels, a lot of this work would be mute, but we have to derive the emotional state of the animal from its behavior. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, assays that are done that I think, you know, we need to think about replacing and improving. Um, so in, in the human uh, condition, in an autism spectrum disorder, which is a complex syndromic phenotype, we have you know, a spectrum of deficits, uh, the three critical things that are uh, used in the clinic are social communication deficits, language deficits, and repetitive behaviors. In the mouse, we, we simplify this to endophenotypic assays. We may look at ultrasonic vocalization assays uh, or social interaction assays or sort of grooming assays to model aspects like repetitive behavior. I don't think I'm stepping out of line here when I say many of the mouse assays have low reproducibility, reliability, and, and translatability. So, you know, let's, again, dr drill deeper into autism spectrum disorder. So this is the, uh, one of the commonly used methods, uh, social interaction, three-chamber social interaction assay, where a mouse is placed, uh, a familiar mouse is placed on one side or object is placed on one side, and a novel mouse is placed on the other side. And the idea is that uh, a, a curious mouse would spend more time with the novel animal than the familiar animal or the object. Uh, it's a short assay during, uh, done during generally the rest phase of the animal, i.e. during daytime. Um, uh, and again, like, you know, it's, it, it suffers from lack of reproducibility across labs, across even the same models get different results in different uh, different labs and even within the lab. So, you know, like, what are we trying to, what's a better assay? So this is a social interaction assay that was done in 1955. And this arena here is 17 feet in diameter. So it's a really large arena, bigger than the room I'm in right now. Um, and in this arena, the researchers introduced 28 males and uh, 28 females and 28 males. And then they watched the evolution of this colony over the next several weeks. And in this colony, what they noticed was that mice tended to form territories. So this here in, in this dotted line is one territory where there's one male and two females. And they, the, both the males and the females would kind of defend this territory. Here's another territory, here's another territory. And in fact, majority of the space is taken up by these kind of territories, but majority of the mice are not in these territories. The majority of the mice are actually up here, 13 males and 19 females in this nest and eight males in, in, in this nest. And uh, the researchers noted that in this 13 male, 19 female nest, there's actually one male that's really dominant and he, they use the term terrorizes everyone else and it really keeps everyone uh, suppressed. And in this eight male colony, the animals have actually, they're defeated males. They would normally be kicked out of the colony um, and would have to look for alternate place to live in, 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 in the outside. Um, they've actually, they're so defeated that they've switched their circadian phase and they actually will go out looking for food during the daytime to avoid kind of conflict with, you know, with, with the rest of the, the mice. So if we're really interested in kind of social interaction, hierarchy, dominance, uh, isolation, stress, all these things, I would compare these animals up here with these animals down here. But there's a reason this has been challenging. Um, uh, you know, this was done in 
you know, many decades ago, and it's it's tough to repeat because it really requires a lot of human intervention to watch and record and, and kind of characterize this colony and this type of approach. But I do believe we're taking steps towards this, and that's what a lot of my work is going to be around better phenotyping methods. The underlying principle of our work actually comes from the BRAIN initiative, which in early on um, uh, asked for automated, better automated quantification of behavior, high temporal and spatial resolution, reliably, objectively over long periods of time under a broad set of conditions and in combination with concurrent measurement and manipulation of neuronal activity. And this field is kind of known as computational ethology. So, so what they're essentially asking for is high resolution behavior annotation, uh, and not short term over long term. And we want to manipulate genetics. We want to manipulate circuits with pharmacology or you know, optogenetics, chemogenetics, things like that. Um, and this was codified in a review by Pedro Perona and David Anderson uh, towards the science of computational ethology in 2014. And, and the reason why this is kind of coming up now, why you know, so many labs have been innovating in this space is really because of technology that's not coming from the biological field, it's coming from the statistical learning and the computer science field um, in terms of just advancements in machine learning methods. Uh, the seminal work of, of uh, uh, kind of AlexNet was done in, in 2012, 20, no, 2013, 2014, around that time. And it's taken us several years, but that work has now kind of had an impact outside of the computer science and statistical learning field. So my lab has been taking advantage of these methods. We started down this line in uh, 2015. I've been thinking about this for over a decade because when I was in uh, the Takahashi lab, I was part of this large scale e &E mutagenesis screen, and we were screening 10,000 mice a year. Uh, and we would take the complex movement of a mouse in an open field, uh, abstract it down to a single point, watch that point move around, and then say, oh, it's it moved X amount and it spent Y amount of time in the corner. And it just seems such a shame to throw away all that rich data of mouse movement. Uh, and, and I started to think about kind of how can we do this better? I spent some time in uh, Genalia, at Christian Branson's lab, who was doing uh, machine learning for, for fly behavior at that time. Uh, and, you know, and, and when I started my own lab, uh, the technology uh, was kind of correct and, and it, it was the right timing to kind of really push on this front. So over the last three years, um, we've had a series of papers on uh, tracking, on uh, assessment of sleep, on pain assessment, uh, pose estimation to look at stride and po uh, kind of posture of the animal, grooming uh, behavior. Uh, and then we've kind of got a couple of preprints on uh, how folks can implement our methods and then also higher level work here. So. Uh, I'm going to just go through a couple of the key things, but I want to keep the, the principles here and focus more on the principles. And feel free to interrupt me if things are not clear. So we're overall interested in this problem of behavior extraction, using machine learning for this. Um, we can go about it in multiple different ways. And that's what I want to kind of cover here is what are the different ways to extract information from video. So I'm gonna cover uh, uh, one approach, which is kind of taking raw video and then predicting what the animal is doing from the raw video. We can also take the video, we can say what in a video is animal and what is not animal. That's a process known as segmentation. And we can take that blob, that segmented blob, and we can operate on that. And so this is kind of this approach of, let's say classifying a blob uh, uh, on a you know on a per frame basis. We could do abstraction at high resolution, so we we can classify pose, and then we can use a set of rules to look at things like gait or social interaction. So this is another approach. We could also take pose information, and we could set up a machine learning classifier to look at behavior, and and this is a classification based approach, but still operating on the pose. 
Um, and then I want to talk finally about something that actually takes all these different methods and combines it to look at something even more abstract, which is the, the biological age of an animal. How do we use behavior to estimate uh, biological age? And, and that has implications for many fields, uh, especially in terms of husbandry welfare. So this is what we're going to cover today. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, in, uh, I'm just going to mention you know, how uh, other labs can implement some of the work we're doing. OK, so we're going to start here in terms of uh, classifying. We're going to take video data, and we're going to say if the animal is grooming or not grooming. And this is a problem known as action detection. So I don't think my video is playing. Anyway, but if, it, if this were playing, you would see the mouse is carrying out grooming. Um, yeah, so um, grooming, I'll just uh, talk through this. Grooming is a, um, it, it, we picked grooming as kind of a prototypical problem because it, it's a complex behavior with many different types of sub behaviors within it. You have very small motions where the mouse is kind of licking its paw. You have mid-sized motion where the mouse is washing its face. And then you have larger motions where the mouse may be body licking. Um, and so the, the question we tried to address in principle was, can we come up with a machine learning classifier, a, a neural network that can detect grooming behavior accurately and if we can do that, then we can just swap out the training data with another behavior and it should become a general purpose action detection. And, and just by swapping out data, you can then detect rearing or any other behavior. So the approach here that we took from a machine learning perspective is we're taking a set of frames. So, so we're taking half a second of data and that information is being used to in, in, a, in a neural network to essentially extract features from that. And then the neural network is simply going to spit out a number that's predictive of whether the animal is grooming or not grooming. So it, it, it essentially is taking raw images and then telling us if the animal is doing a behavior or not. And then in, in a kind of a, a, a slightly modified approach, we don't just use one neural network. We actually use a multitude, a consensus of network. And then this actually helps improve the prediction even more. And uh, this is not going to play either. Uh, it's OK. Um, so uh, what you would see here is that you know this mouse starts to groom. And then uh, the prediction here on the Y from the neural network is whether the animal is, is grooming or not grooming. Um, going to be a very boring presentation if the videos don't work. <laughs> um, let me just try something. Hmm. Wootley, I'm just going to stop and reshare again, OK? So you should be able to. Okay, so you'll see on the on the y-axis here is the prediction coming from the neural network, and when it crosses fifty percent, we call that as as grooming. So so this method works quite well, and that's quantitated in in the next slide. So uh, just a receiver operator curve, so true positive versus false positive. Um, uh, so we're kind of here, the final neural network solution is this uh, red peach line. And uh, we compared it to an older, uh, uh, a different classifier that operates on the ellipse of a mouse, not the raw video. And, and you see we gained quite a bit of performance. And in fact, uh, this level of performance, so if you kind of gate this at 5% false, po false positive, uh, the older version will get around 60% true positive, whereas we're at around 90, uh, 92, 93% true positive. And, and so I would say this is a 
you know, this is a working solution for what I'm going to describe to you next, which is a uh, kind of application of this at scale. Um, and, and so this method also kind of caps off at 92, 93% because humans uh, only agree around 92, 93% of the time on where, you know, whether an animal is grooming. And we did this study that's, doc that's in the paper where we had five individuals kind of score the behavior and we found that the concordance was varied, but on average was around 92, 93% of the time. So this is kind of, we're operating on human la uh, labels. So we're kind of capping off at, uh, on the performance. Um, so, you know, so this is now a scalable solution. So here uh, we're looking at 2,500 videos, 2,200 hours of video. Each dot is 55 minutes of a male or a female. And I'm just showing you total duration grooming. There's bunch of metrics you can extract, we did extract from this, but this is just, you know, the scale that we can operate at. Every column here is a different strain of mouse. Um, and, you know, there's lots of insights here uh, once we are able to operate at that scale. So for instance, BTBRs, so again, coming back to autism, are on, on the high end, but are not exceptionally high. There are several other strains that are at the same level of grooming as BTBRs. The controls are here, or not the controls, the reference frames, uh, black six J's are here, and J's. Everything in peach uh, or purple is a wild derived strain. And you can see that the wild derives tend to be on the high end. And we actually proposed in the paper that grooming as behavior may have been selected out in the, the laboratory strains because most of these laboratory strains derive from mouse fanciers who may have selected mouse that, mice that were not constantly grooming themselves because grooming could be a sign of disease and you know, not uh, uh, bad health. So uh, you know, there's lots of insights here. We, we characterize the grooming patterns. We kind of uh, uh, saw three types of grooming behavior in, in these mice also. Um, we, I'm a geneticist, so we, we did uh, uh, the GWAS analysis, uh, which we can do from all the strain survey data. We found you know, over 100 QTLs for different grooming behaviors and open field behaviors. And then we linked it to human traits through PWAS. So we took the genes that are underlying the QTL peaks from the mouse GWAS and then said, what are these genes regulating in the human GWAS data? And uh, we went to the psychiatric genetics data and we were able to kind of start to link genes with psychiatric phenotypes, but these are gene lists coming out of the genetic analysis for grooming and open field behavior in the mouse. So we can start to kind of move across and, and think of grooming and uh, these behaviors uh, as a surrogate for psychiatric conditions based on the underlying genetics. So this is all part of this Eli paper that we published last year. So that's one approach. We're going from raw video to behavior. The next approach I'm going to talk about is mouse gait and posture. Um, and here we're on, on this end. Um, so we're not going to operate on the raw video. We're going to take the raw video, we're going to abstract the mouse to key points, and then we're going to operate on that on those key points. And uh, we picked gait and posture because gait and posture are uh, you know, indicative and proper gait and posture indicative of many different neuronal and non-neuronal process. And so the ability to detect gait posture at high resolution can be really a, a really nice use in a preclinical space and, and, you know, neurobiological space. So um, we first kind of had this problem of dealing with disparate strains of mice. Again, uh, you know, uh, Budley, I know you mentioned in terms of the three R's, the data that I'm going to show you is all the same. Like what we did for grooming, we used the same data for uh, gait analysis, and we, you know, we've used the same data uh, in at least three, and we're working on two more papers from the same data. So the video offers a huge amount of ability to reuse data and also to build data in a hierarchical way. So we can kind of analyze today's data with data that was collected a year ago as long as we're kind of consistent in that data format, the collection of the data. Anyway, so, so we start with this idea of like having to deal with mice that are very different visually. So 
in here, there's actually like a mouse, it's a, it's a newt mouse. We have mice that have uh, every strain or every individual in that mouse uh, strain has a different coat color because our slightly different coat pattern, think of like calico cats. Um, and, and we did, we abstracted the mouse to these key points and then we could watch these key points uh, for pose. So I'm gonna pause this. So this was actually, believe it or not, the straightforward, easier uh, component. The harder part was taking this pose information and going to uh, actual gait. And here we, uh, you know, this is a field that goes back to the 1970s. These are Hildebrand plots of when the animal is striking the ground and when it's lifting its foot up. Um, and we're able to extract that based on the velocity of, of the points. So for instance, if we look, every one of these dots represents when the right rear paw of the mouse touches the ground and the blue is the left rear paw. And so every time it touches the ground, the velocity goes to zero or when it lifts and moves, it, the velocity increases. So we get these kind of cyclical patterns and then we're able to take that information and extract gate from that. And uh, the other added advantage of our method is um, just the number of data points. So these are just the key points. This is the nose, the back of the neck, the base of the tail. Uh, this is the tip of the tail. Every point on the left represents one stride coming out of the video. So we get lots of repeated measurements. That's one thing. The second thing is mice are not walking in a straight line. They actually have kind of a swagger. And so if you watch a, a stride cycle, you see that the base of the tail will go up will come down and then end up in the middle. The nose is antiphasic to that, and the tail is in the same phase as the base of the tail, but has a larger amplitude. And right away, when we, uh, and so this is how we quantitate this. So if you put a point on the base of the tail, the point would kind of have this phenotype over a stride cycle, and we can extract, and this gets into circular statistics. We can extract a phase, we can extract an amplitude, and then the nose is kind of antiphasic. To the, to the tail. Right away, we knew this was important because when we went to our strain data, these are 10 different strains, we saw massive variability in this phenotype. So we're looking at that tail tip lateral displacement. If you compare the, the red here, which is black 6 j or the purple, which is black 6 nj to something like the BTBRs in green or the Norse in blue, you see there, you know, they're just, just they're completely 180 degree antiphasic. Uh, the amplitude is very different. From a genetics perspective, we call this uh, trait as having high heritability. So we validated this, our methods with three mutants. Um, uh, these are known gate mutants, MECP2, the Brett syndrome, SOD1, so this is ALS, and then Down syndrome model. I'm just gonna show you data from the Down syndrome because it's very dramatic and, um, and, and and this model was actually quite important. This was developed at the Jackson Laboratory by Muriel Davison. Um, for the field, this was a major advance. And we know that motor coordination deficits happen quite often in, um, in, uh, in down uh, children and they're clumsy, they tend to hurt themselves. And, and so they were looking for these motor coordination deficits in the mouse and they did an ink blot analysis. So they are literally putting ink on the back of the feet of the two uh, mice and then having them walk on white paper and then analyzing the footprints. And you can see that the down mice have slightly irregular gait pattern and are not walking in a, in a straight line. And this was evidence of, um, you know, motor coordination deficit. So we took these mice, we placed them in our one hour open field assay. So we're just kind of getting them from the uh, repository here and just placing them into our apparatus. And we saw just immense difference. So gait is uh, varies based on speed. So here are three speeds of mice, uh, 15 to 25. And we're again, looking at that tail tip lateral displacement measure. And we can see that the down mice are over here, very different phase and amplitude compared to the control. And this allows us essentially to quantitate a qualitative trait very nicely. And in terms of preclinical space, if the 
motor coordination deficits are reflective or if they can work as a surrogate for the cognitive deficits, which you know the researchers need to show that they can be linked, um, then this becomes a very easy interventional tool, i.e. it's much easier to screen through compounds, libraries, uh, efficacy studies with gait and posture than it is with, let's say, a cognitive assay in a mouse, which is much more cumbersome with a lot less, uh, again, uh, reproducibility and, and there are challenges in, in those and scalability. So think about this in, in that, again, the three R perspective. So um, the data previously was with kind of known uh, models of, of gait deficits. We then extended it to autism models. Uh, here, we're looking at four different autism models, CATNAP2, FMR1, SHANK3, and a, a Delta 4 AM. Uh, uh, this is a duplication of uh, chromosome 16, I think. Um, and then on the left is um, p-value, on the right are effect size. And you can see like every one of the, and, and every row is a phenotype. Uh, you know, every one of the autism MOTS models had some significant difference in gait or posture. Some like the CATNAP2 have a lot of differences. And in fact, if you look at the CATNAP2 in principal component space, we can distinguish the mutants from the controls purely based on its movement in the open field. Okay. So again, that's a really powerful approach if, if the movement deficits can uh, serve as a surrogate for uh, you know, the, the uh, vocalization, uh, social interaction, uh, language deficits, things like that. So, um, so just two kind of examples here. There's a lot of information. So again, like we mined that data set of thousands of videos that we have. We characterized gait in 62 inbred strains, uh, 1800 mice. Um, we, are, we are able to, again, do GWAS. So uh, most of the traits are highly heritable. Uh, and because these are, we get repeated measures out of uh, movement phenotypes, i.e. from one mouse, we can get you know, uh, hundreds of strides, we can actually not just look at stride length, we can look at the variance in stride length. So it turns out that the variance phenotypes are also uh, heritable. And in fact, we found QTLs for both mean and variance phenotypes, but they're for the larger part distinct QTLs, i.e. the variance in phenotype is controlled by different genetics than the mean of that phenotype. So that was something also that uh, we characterized in this. Okay, so uh, let me see how I'm doing in terms of time. I want to make sure I save at least 10 minutes in the end. So um, let me talk a little bit about the middle approach here of classifying a blob. And here we were interested in sleep, uh, and not just whether the animal is asleep or wake, but sleep stages, i.e. REM, non-REM, and wake. And so we worked with Alan Pack, and we sent them some of our cameras and, and collected data in his sleep chambers. And what we do is we, we essentially have a EG EMG, and, th and this is just for training, that the ground truth comes from uh, human scored EG EMG data. And then we take a neural network uh, of the, uh, and we take this image and we segment out the mouse. So we're not doing any pose, we're not operating at this level, we're just taking the video and we're just saying, is there a mouse or no mouse on a pixel-wise basis? So we just take this segmented information. And now though, with the segmented information, we can extract uh, image moments, we can extract uh, different features from it. And when we looked at this over time, we saw that there was lots of information about the animals, uh, what the animal was doing in terms of breathing rates and other features um, that could be extracted simply from this segmented, uh, segmented mouse. And so from this, we then extract a set of features. Uh, we use those features to train a classifier uh, uh, for, uh, to predict the REM, non-REM, and wake states. And we actually do quite well. Uh, in fact, we compared our method to other non-invasive, non-EG, EMG methods. And, um, uh, and, and our method is the best so far that's been described 
in, in, in the literature. So this then becomes a high throughput kind of, you know, method for uh, uh, quickly screening through lots of mice using computer vision, no surgeries required. And then I would argue that if you're really interested in, in deep detailed phenotypic characterization of certain mouse uh, strains, then you can do the EEG, EMG in them and then generate more data. So, so this is a slightly modified approach of, from what I showed in terms of raw video and pose and operating on the segmentation output. Um, let me also talk about um, visual frailty because uh, this one is an interesting problem. So we were approached by Gary Churchill um, and the shock center here that works on aging problem. And, uh, and, and they do in terms of, you know, they're interested in quantifying biological age of, uh, of a mouse. And biological age in humans can be determined by frailty indexing. This frailty indexing is done where you have kind of a set of measures such as, you know, uh, uh, waist, uh, kind of hip ratios, um, you can have body fat, you can have clinical blood chemistry, all these kind of things that you get from electronic health records. And generally frailty in humans are conducted with these mostly objective measures coming from, let's say your visit to the physician done over years and uh, folks can mine thousands of, of health records too for this. Um, in the mouse though, a frailty indexing is done, let's say in an interventional mouse study, a mouse has been given a group of cohort of mice have been given, you know, rapamycin or something like that, and or diet intervention, and they're interested over the next two years or three years assessing the biological age of the animal. So the mouse is examined by a trained observer, and there's a set of about 27, 30 index items, and then the trained observer quickly kind of marks uh, these items, and they're generally scoring the item as a 0 0.5 or 1. And then they aggregate all these and they may say, well, this mouse has a frailty score of 12 um, and this mouse may have a frailty score of six. Because it's being done by a human, um, that index item becomes subjective. And in fact, we were finding that there's a lot of, uh, depending on who does the frailty assay, there's a level of, uh, not a small, but a large level of, uh, of variance uh, in, introduced in the data from, from that. So um, Gary asked us if we could do better or we could, let's say, augment the frailty assay with our video-based assay. And right away, we knew that information about the biological age of the animal is encoded in the video. Uh, this is a young spry two-month-old mouse, and this is a more mature 34-month-old mouse. And you can see overall the size of the mouse is different. The movement of the mouse is different. Um, and the question then becomes, is there enough information coming uh, out of this video to let's say make a useful frailty index? And we call that a visual frailty index. And in fact, uh, the features that are going in are all those features like grooming, like uh, gait information that I just showed you earlier. And we've actually even engineered other features. Like for instance, we looked at we design features to measure flexibility of the animal. We design features to measure the waist length ratio of the animal. Um, so we designed a set of features that we think, you know, that we think are indicative of uh, biological age. Uh, and then we trained a model uh, to predict the frailty of the animal. And, and so the experimental flow, just like in the sleep, is the ground truth comes from the human frailty indexing. Uh, and then we measure that same mouse for in our open field and we try and predict the human, uh, the, the human score frailty number from that. And in fact, this works quite well. Uh, we can predict frailty uh, uh, within an error of one index item out of 30 or 27 index items. Um, and so, you know, we feel like this is, a, this is a very good method, a high throughput objective method of uh, determining frailty of the animal. And I think we can even do better because this is only one hour video. Imagine if we had 24 hours video or video for the entirety of the lifetime of the animal uh, and the features coming out of that, or we had multiple animals and we could have social interaction features and things like that. So, um, you know, we feel like this is a, this is a really interesting method also because once you can determine something as abstract as biological age, we can start to look at things 
uh, like you know health span and wellness and you know is the animal sick and does the vet need to come and you know pay attention to that animal we can even start to think about extending this work to for instance uh, cancer models because right now uh, you know in, in the PDX core at JAX uh, the best way of determining a tumor is uh, you know someone again trained to uh, look for tumors on the surface of the mouse. And by the time you actually found the tumor, sometimes it's too late to do any interventional study. So could the behavior predict tumors days or weeks earlier? Um, so there's a lot of application for this type of um, approach. Um, and then finally, let me just end with nociception. Um, this was an interesting project because we were asked by the uh, CBA, the Center for Biometric Analysis, and Jackie White's team to help them in this project that was uh, from the IMPC, the International Mass Phenotyping Consortium. I see there are several folks here from, from there. Um, and the goal of it was we were doing this video-based assay where the mice were filmed from the bottom. The mice were then injected with formalin, and so this is an inflammatory pain model, and then uh, the the scorer, which was human, would score how many times the animal licks in the last, you know, in the next hour or so. So we essentially uh, automated this. Again, we're using key points, uh, uh, and we kind of have this idea of uh, per frame features and window features. Uh, this comes from uh, kind of field of active learning. There's a paper from Kristen Branson uh, and a software called Java that, uh, you know, that. Uh, implements this. Um, we set up our own kind of pipeline and, and this works, you know, quite well. This helped us screen through hundreds of mice and, you know, lots of hours of video. The issue that I had with this approach was that it's a bottom-up videoing and uh, inherently, you know, my lab, for instance, doesn't do bottom-up video. We do top-down. Most labs are doing top-down open field assays. And then also, if we're interested in chronic pain, where we need to observe animals for days or weeks, um, bottom-up is not really feasible because we need bedding, the mouse defecates, urinates. So a top-down approach is, is much better. So in unpublished work, we've um, implemented, just using our open field apparatus again, a, uh, a simpler, we, we simplified, um, noseception, uh, classifier. So essentially it's, it creates a, it's a univariate classifier. Video goes in, features are extracted, and then it predicts on how much pain the model, uh, the mouse may be in. And instead of looking at just one behavior, such as licking or second behavior like shaking, which are normally done, we're able to extract 82 different features from the simple one hour video. So we get a lot more information about what the mouse may be doing. And then just to you know, show you, we, we tested this on four different strains, kind of two high response and two low response strains. And you know, we find this works well. It adds a lot more discrimination uh, power and we're able to detect dose differences even on up analgesics such as morphine using, um, or sorry, morphine administration using this uh, uh, approach. And we're able to detect different dosages of formalin using using this approach. So this is a paper we hope to have in bioarchive uh, soon. And it's also operating for the most part on the pose estimation, not the raw video on the pose estimation. Okay, so I kind of went through the different approaches. So in, in the classification of raw video as an example of grooming, classification of, of a blob in, in terms of sleep, and uh, I didn't mention this ellipse tracking, um, classification of uh, pose-based and heuristic rules-based method is what we did for gait, and I'll show you some data with social interaction. And then we can also take pose information and, and set up a classifier to classify behaviors, which is what we used in the nociception. And all these can be combined to determine the frailty of the animals, which is what we did in the frailty assay. So the question then becomes, how do labs start implementing some of this? Because if we've gone to the trouble of training a grooming classifier or a gate method, it'd be great if, if other labs don't have to redo the work and they can simply implement our methods. 
So we've been working on this, what we call JAX automatic, well, we changed the name, it's called JAX animal behavior system now. Um, and it has different components like data acquisition. Um, and we've set up, you know, we've open sourced our hardware and our, um, uh, our software for data collection. Um, then there's this, you know, this idea of behavior annotation. So all those uh, individual behaviors that uh, I showed you, gait, grooming, all these things. Um, and then we want to be able to share the classifiers, i.e. Uh, uh, once there's a good behavior classifier, we want that classifier to be disseminated amongst the research community. And then finally, we want to be able to characterize the behavior in large data sets. Uh, if we have a data set of uh, you know, 2,500 mice, if someone uses our data acquisition system and they have their own strain, as long as the data is uniform, they should be able to compare their data with the 2,500 mouse, 60 plus strains of mouse data. So that's very powerful. Uh, and then we want to be able to integrate the data, the behavior data with genomics, with physiology, with other modalities of data. And so we've been kind of on this end developing solutions uh, and the core principle here is we want to operate on high, uh, we want to have standardized high quality data collection. We want to have a standardized analytic data pipeline and we want to have minimal human intervention. And this will allow us to compare data across labs, location and time. So our open field apparatus is kind of a two foot by two foot. It's got a uh, four foot, uh, four square foot Foot space, foot space and it's around six feet tall. We collect data with multiple mice. We've done our typical experiments now are four days long. We've collected data as uh, long as 28 days. Um, underlying this is really this pose estimation. Every mouse gets a pose. Features are extracted from the pose. We've uh, uh, posted or shared a active learning system. So this is very useful in the sense users can go in and they can say behavior is not happening here, it is happening here, and you guide the classifier towards recognizing your behavior of interest. And so this is a process known as active learning and, and this app allows that to happen. And then finally, once someone has developed a, uh, a classifier that they feel is working, uh, we want to be able to share that. So this component is not live yet, but the idea here is, uh, you know, we deposit all our grooming classifier or uh, flexibility classifier, all these different things, and other labs can just get them. And as long as they're collecting data using this kind of uniform hardware software, they can operate and use our classifiers on that data. And then finally, the power of this also is if a lab has a specific behavior and they deposit that classifier for that behavior, what we'll do on the back end is we'll take that classifier and we'll infer our 2,500 mouse video data set. And instantly, what the user will get back is heritability information. So is that behavior heritable? And what are the underlying genetics of GWAS data for that behavior? So this again, like, um, you know, if you're familiar with things going on in, in, for instance, what Rob Williams has, has done with Gene Network or uh, Mouse Phenome Database. You know, this is a very uh, concept that's old in the mouse genetics community, and we're enabling, we're, we hope to enable it and, uh, with uh, advanced computer vision-based uh, behaviors here. Okay, so just some recent data. Uh, so here we're looking at social interaction. Uh, this is multiple mouse tracking where, where we have four days of continuous data with BTBR and black six. So they're either uh, three BTBRs or three black six in an arena. And then we tried to just replicate data coming from Carolyn Blanchard's lab that was published in 2010 where they human annotated and did this experiment for four days. Uh, of course, they were only able to annotate a very small amount of data, but it gives us some information about what kind of a ground truth data set may be. So we essentially looked at chase approach, nose, nose contact and nose in the general contact. Um, uh, and, and these were the kind of 
behaviors that this uh, Kobe et al. paper looked at. And I want to emphasize two things here. One is the data looks fantastic. So um, we're looking at, for instance, oral oral contact here, or oral general contact, or total distance move, 96 hours of data. Underlying each one of these points is uh, either seven or eight groups of three. So we're looking at you know, 21, uh, 21 or 24 mice, depending on which strain. Um, so you see this nice kind of diurnal variation in the behavior. Um, uh, if you notice, like BTBRs tend to be more uh, kind of not as active at the uh, at the at their relative rest phase than the B6. A better way of looking at this data is this waveform data. Now you can really start to see difference between B6 and BTBR, for instance, for chase or oral oral contact or oral genital contact um, or you know, approach contact, uh, approach behavior. And so, uh, and, and these are all in line with what was shown in that Kobe et al. paper. Um, and so what we did next was we said, this is great, but let's look at the reproducibility of this data. So we just replicated this data in a different building with a different set of mice um, six months later. Uh, and so the previous data I showed you was in the CBA uh, at the Jackson Laboratory, and then the, new, and the later data are coming from B2, uh, a room called B2B. And, you know, you see, again, the same kind of uh, uh, level of difference where the BTBRs have less sociability than the B6s. The Y scale has changed slightly, but the difference in the strain has remained really consistent. In fact, we've now repeated this in a third room, and we see the same uh, you know, the magnitude of, of difference. So we feel like this social interaction data uh, and approach is much more reproducible, robust, because we're just letting the mice do what they like to do. Let me just skip this. Uh, and then let me just end with this idea that uh, we have a four-year course uh, that's coming uh, at JAX on behavior quantification, if anyone's interested. Uh, uh, you know, you can find a web page for this. We're just in the process of kind of finalizing the speakers and things like that. And this will go on for four years. And then there are a lot of people that have been involved with this, uh, with this work. So I'll just stop there and um, take questions.